So yes, Bitcoin's been going up for all these fundamental reasons we talked about, but so has the stock market. I wonder if the music, if the music stops for the Nasdaq, will the music also stop for Bitcoin? For a term, yes. Look, if we see a massive correction, first of all, if you see a massive correction, then the Fed will cut rates. But but let's just assume. Look, there's an old expression in a in a crash correlations go to one. Yeah. Why is that? That's because all the hedge fund owners of all this stuff, the directors basically walk onto the floor or tell their risk managers, sell 20% of everything. When you do that, everything can be sold, get sure, sold. Sure. Bitcoin is sort of unique because if that happens on a Saturday or a Sunday, it's the only thing they can sell. And so Bitcoin tends yeah. to be a leading indicator when there's a crash on a weekend. Bitcoin is reaching yet another all-time high this Monday. What's next? What's driving this rally? What are the fundamentals? What can we expect going forward? And what can we expect for the rest of the crypto markets as well as the stock markets? We're talking stocks, Bitcoin, cryptos, and macro with our next guest, Dave Weisberger, chairman of CoinRoutes. First, a word from our sponsor, iTrust Capital, an IRA that offers 35 crypto assets and the lowest trading fees in the crypto IRA space at 1%. If you'd like to learn more about uh, this offer, click on itrust.capital slash David in the link down below and get a $100 US signing bonus for funding your account with my link. Uh, itrust offers also unique tax benefits. So if you're over 18 and you'd like to open a new account or roll over an existing account with cap cash, you can do so using the link down below. Click to learn more and consider an IRA to park your Bitcoin profits this bull rally season. Dave, welcome back to the show. Good to see you. Thank you, Dave. Pleasure to be here as always. So first off, congrats on the title change from CEO to chairman. We'll talk more about uh, CoinRoutes and your latest projects and developments later on in the interview. But first, let's review market updates. So as we're speaking today on Monday, Bitcoin tops 71K, briefly reached 72K. People are betting on a lot of things. They're betting on uh, renewed, sustained momentum in the stock markets. They're betting on perhaps no recession. They're betting on a Fed pivot. They're betting on uh, new adoption of Bitcoin that we can talk about. I'm reading this article today. Uh, ordinal activities are picking up on Bitcoin layer one. So what do you make of this momentum? Look, we're in a trading range right now at the top of the range, right? So between somewhere between 72 and 68, maybe a little squishiness on either side. We've been there for a few weeks. I think that's very healthy. Uh, the longer we go, the more likely it is that we will use this as a springboard higher. There really isn't any resistance above where we are in a technical sense, because just about no human beings on the planet bought Bitcoin higher than this and are itching to get out from any length of time, which generally creates resistance. But what I think probably the most important way I look at this is the lack of euphoria uh, in Bitcoin. Now, there is definitely euphoria in other areas in crypto and definitely many other things going on. But in Bitcoin, there isn't any. Two stats. Stat number one, the last time we were at, at these levels, a little bit below this at the previous all-time high at the end of 21, uh, the hash rate, the network power of Bitcoin, which really is the most fundamental piece of Bitcoin, you know, fundamental measure of, of, of what it's worth, uh, was one-fourth what it is today. So that's extremely important because if you do a network normalized price of Bitcoin, we're not any close to an all-time high. And that matters a lot. The second piece of data that I like to look at is Bitcoin vis-a-vis -vis gold. And gold, which is generally speaking, most people who invest in Bitcoin, whether it's Paul Tudor Jones or Larry Fink or other the traditional types, look at Bitcoin as going to become digital gold and ultimately replace it in the digital world. But gold has been on a, on a tear, rallying substantively, meaning that any past way of looking at Bitcoin price at, relative to gold, well, now there's longer to go. So honestly, anybody who made price predictions based upon a level of adoption this cycle probably have to ratchet them up anywhere from at least 25, 30% to three or four times, depending on which value metric they're looking at. The bottom line is, is we're not close to euphoric. This isn't close to a bubble. It is what it is, right? It is Bitcoin, is, as I talked about it with you the last time, trades like an option on its potential future adoption. And that likelihood now is greater than it's ever been. And we're looking at price levels that seem to be pretty well balanced as new buyers come in and the crypto 
sellers are essentially taking profits off of Bitcoin to try something in altcoins, meme coins, or whatever. Uh, that's not the kind of thing that goes on for a long period of time. So unless there's a big macro shock, I would expect a resumption of the rally at some point in the next three to six months. Why is the adoption of Bitcoin going to be more um, profound now than ever? We've talked about the Bitcoin ETFs on my show. So that's one use case of Bitcoin for potentially new investors that per previously have not had access to Bitcoin. But what other applications do you see emerging that could profoundly? Well, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I want to take that divide that question in half. You mentioned the other application, the use of the Bitcoin blockchain, you know, whether it's ordinals, runes, however you want to look sure. at it. The use of the Bitcoin blockchain is another application. And it's a highly secure, extremely well-validated application set. So let's put that off to the side for a heartbeat. All right. The thing about the Bitcoin ETFs here in London and in Hong Kong have, is not about use case. It's about adoption. If you looked at, if you go rewind the tape. So now we're in April. If you rewind the tape to early January before the Bitcoin ETFs launched, the most aggressive predictions for the kind of investor interest we would get was somewhere between 10 and 15 billion in the first six months. In fact, most of the average is probably about 15 billion for the entire year of 2024. We are way past that. The Bitcoin ETF is now un un just undeniably the most successful ETF launch in decades. And, and it wasn't just one. There are multiple Bitcoin ETFs that would have made into the top five list over the last decade or so. And that, that's really a big thing. That shows you just how much untapped demand there is, how many people actually believe in the narrative of Bitcoin as a store of value. But as the knife salesman would say, there's more, David. The fact is that we still haven't even seen the, the most of the professional uh, RIAs and FAs be able to allocate Bitcoin on behalf of their larger clients because the systems have not allowed that yet. That is just kind of starting now, and we expect it to accelerate in the back half of the year. So we're seeing an enormous amount of demand based upon the narrative that's being, you know, basically being promoted by, I would say, you know, the lead cheerleader is Larry Fink of BlackRock. And BlackRock has done phenomenal in terms of gathering assets. But remember, this was a man who years ago, not too many years ago, was a big skeptic. And now he has joined the ranks of declaring it as going to be the digital store of value or the, the base layer of the Internet of money, whatever, whichever way you want to look at it going forward. That has weight. And we're seeing that happen. In Hong Kong, you know, we've seen that they're going to allow Bitcoin ETFs to be owned by Chinese investors. That's not a small thing, right? You know, this comes on the heels of years of the Chinese government supposedly cracking down. Yet, you know, there, there's some issues there. Uh, all of this speaks to adoption because the reality is network effects, adoption, things that create, you know, this sort of value really requires the concept. We, I always used to use the word critical mass. Once you get enough people believing in the value of a thing, it takes on a life of its own and has that value. Gold got over that hump you know, thousands of years ago. Before that, it was seashells, right? And that lasted for a long period of time. I think we're on the cusp of Bitcoin getting into that club, either this cycle or next cycle, but it's certainly doing, it certainly advanced more in the last six months, even in the last three months than most people expected in 2024. I, I, did you just compare Bitcoin to seashells? <laughs> did you, is that what I you did. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, seashells were, you know, were money for 2000 years. Then people realize, oh, wait a minute, they wash up on the shore and it's much harder to find gold and so and silver. You know, silver was really money before gold was because it was easier to use than gold demonetized silver. But either way, precious metals became money because it had characteristics of money. Bitcoin has all those characteristics of money, provable scarcity, hard to counterfeit, portability, divisibility, endurance, you know, endurability, I don't know, durability, I guess it is. Uh, it, it has all the right characteristics of money. The, what it needs is adoption. And these narratives are feeding adoption. Bitcoin dominance is rising, which indicates mm -hmm. that Bitcoin is outperforming most of the other cryptos. So here's a quote from the Ripple CEO. This article came out yesterday. Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse said that um, he expects the entire value of the cryptocurrency market to top $5 trillion this year, which would double the market cap. 
uh, citing macro factors including the arrival of the first U.S. spot Bitcoin exchange traded funds as well as the upcoming so-called Bitcoin halving. I've been around this industry for a long time and I've seen this trends come and go. Garling has told CNBC, I'm very optimistic. I think the macro trends, the big picture things like the ETFs, they're driving for the first time real institutional money. So we're talking about Bitcoin, you and I. Dave, what about the rest of the cryptocurrency? Do you agree with his view doubling by the end of the year, $5 trillion in market cap? I wouldn't be surprised if he were right. I mean, I, I hate to worry about, to talk about timing. I think that the interesting thing is, is and coming from Brad's point of view, it's particularly important, is there are multiple really important use cases emerging for crypto assets. I hate to call them cryptocurrencies. It's the only real currency per se, uh, I think is Bitcoin or will be, but, but we'll leave that aside. The, the fact is the smart contract world, whether it's Solana creating a better version of the casino to trade meme coins than Ether or Ether for all of the things you can trade on it or Dpin, you know, for physical infrastructure or gaming or AI for securing large data and, and for uh, big LLMs. There's lots of use cases that are growing out there that people will speculate on. The, the truth is that a doubling of the asset class, if Bitcoin does what I expect it to do, it's almost certain given the correlation between Bitcoin and everything else. Because the, the nature of the beast is money comes into Bitcoin, it goes higher. People who are in Bitcoin are generally, there's a lot, look, there's a lot of gamblers out there. There's no two ways about it who like leverage. They will bid it up. Or they'll say, mm, you know what, let me take some off the table and put leverage into something else. And that something else could be, you know, it could be layer ones like Solana or Ether. It could be meme coins like Doge, or you go out on the curve to some new meme coins, other sort of stuff like Bonk or, you know, I, I don't want to name some of the other ones because they, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're memes on being insulting. But the fact is that meme culture is real, David. I mean, we just saw in the stock market. The ultimate meme stock is Truth Social, is Donald D DJT. You know, we've been seeing it with AMC theaters. We've been seeing it with Bed Bath & Beyond. We saw it, obviously, with GameStop. That movie is actually good, the Dumb Money movie. It's actually pretty good. There's lots going on there. But the fact is, is it's real. And so, yeah, I mean, the one thing that's interesting about crypto that people don't understand is the market structure for trading crypto is very, very well built and very democratic. People in traditional finance, you know, we, you hear a lot of people talking about RWA or real world assets. What they're really saying, and this is a fact, is that eventually the crypto market structure and what's going on here will be the way every asset, whether it's equities or bonds, get traded. It's going to take a long time because there are a lot of people who make money from an inefficient system. But understand that, that how quickly you could spin up a meme coin, how quickly it could get to significant volume traded is a very interesting thing. And it, it definitely scares people in the traditional financial establishment. You mentioned to me offline that the correlations between different cryptos and Bitcoin are breaking down, meaning typically in the past when Bitcoin has moved up, other things have moved up in tandem or to the same extent. Uh, you've noticed through data analysis that uh, many cryptos are moving lower than expected. Um, so what do you make of this correlation breakdown? Well, I think that as you get to these points in a cycle, generally before 2024, when you got to people in the world of crypto, they use the word alt season, which I always think I can't help it. But I think of Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck, you know, rabbit season, you know, duck season. And there's an old set of cartoons about that going back and forth, trying to film the hunter. Like, like there's this binary in the market that said, I'm either buying Bitcoin to a lesser degree, Ethereum, or I'm buying all these altcoins. And when I buy the altcoins, the others kind of drop, you know, kind of come down. And then these things kind of stagnate. And people, oh, they start going down. And then this starts going up. And you see this sort of, you know, binary thing. We're not seeing that. Uh, what we've seen is Bitcoin move into a trading range. And when it goes to the top of the trading range, like it is now, uh, altcoins, you know, kind of have less fervor. Not really. There's plenty of further and froth, but there's also coins that are not doing as well. Obviously, Solana had some issues with being... The best way I could describe it, it feels like their own network was DDoSing themselves, but Solana had some network failure, so it came down. But if you look at the way the correlation among coins are, it's not, it's it's nowhere near as strong as it used to be uh, in this in this sort of thing. So you're seeing a little bit more discrimination, a little bit more sophistication on behalf of uh, of traders of crypto these days. How much 
will the having impact the price ultimately if you take into account adoption? As you know, post having the supply of Bitcoin will drop to 450 new Bitcoins per day. I wonder if this new adoption you were talking about earlier is going to outstrip this supply post having. Well, yes, is the answer. Uh, we know that already. You can see, given you know that how how very early we are in the adoption cycle by the the, the traditional financial world. Yes, it will outstrip the supply, and therefore it will require higher prices to convince people who have it to sell it. That seems fairly clear to me. The actual magnitude of the having, though, is much smaller than been the magnitude of the inflows that we've seen in the Bitcoin ETF. And so it is interesting. The most important thing about the halvening in every case is it's more proof of the stability and durability of the network itself. The fact that here we are approaching the halvening and because to some degree of ordinals and runes, et cetera, miners are still adding capacity. There's still belief in the network. It, typically what happens, if you thought, think about gold, just imagine a weird world where the gold price that that gold miners got paid went down by a half. Would miners, would gold miners be adding capacity as it approached that? And the answer is no, they'd be pulling it off. And in fact, inflation and gold price tends to increase more mining capacity being added. And when it falls, it tends to fall, right? So it kind of counterbalances. Bitcoin doesn't have that dynamic. Bitcoin's dynamic is a fixed monetary policy. And, you know, I kind of liken it if you're a sci-fi geek like me, and you read the original Foundation series by Asimov, I kind of liken it to the idea of, of Harry Seldon's psychohistory. Somebody or some people or whatever your theory about who's, who or what Satoshi was had this idea of, okay, let's create this schedule for the next N number of years out through 2140 and say, this is the monetary policy of this thing that we want to be a global store of value. Every happening increases the overall veracity of how that network can endure. And the fact that the network is at all time highs approaching a happening to me is extremely bullish for the long-term viability of Bitcoin. That's the most important thing. The supply demand dynamic obviously matters. It's not small, but 450 Bitcoin a day is not moving the needle nearly as much as the demand drivers and the acceptance. We haven't talked about the broad markets. Um, you're in a good position to talk about both TradFi and cryptos, as you've had plenty of experience working on Wall Street in TradFi. I want to talk about mm -hmm. how the Bitcoin market has been affected by um, the overall stock market indices and whether or not this correlation will continue. So, yes, Bitcoin has been going on for all these fundamental reasons we talked about, but so has the stock market. I wonder if the music, if the music stops for the NASDAQ, will the music also stop for Bitcoin this year? For, for a term, yes. Look, if we see a massive correction, first of all, if you see a massive correction, then the Fed will cut rates. Uh, they probably won't if it doesn't happen because inflation is very sticky. Oh, that's interesting. I want to talk about the condition. Yeah, but please continue. But, but let's just assume, look, there's an old expression, in a, in a crash, correlations go to one. Yeah. Why is that? That's because all the hedge fund owners of all this stuff, the directors basically walk onto the floor or tell their risk managers, sell 20% of everything. When you do that, everything can be sold, get sure, sold. Sure. Bitcoin is sort of unique because if that happens on a Saturday or a Sunday, it's the only thing they can sell. And so Bitcoin tends yeah. to be a leading indicator when there's a crash on a weekend. But the truth is that I think a D-link happens after that. In 2008, it took three months. But in 2008, gold went down with the stock markets. And then three months later, gold started on an epic rally when the stock market was obviously in the toilet for over another year. So you get D-links and they happen. So it, it, it's important how you phrase the question. The real dynamic going on right now is the Federal Reserve, what are they going to do? My friend James Lavish, who does the Informationist newsletter, and he and I do a, a, a weekly podcast on the Wolf of All Streets on macro, he likes to say the Fed has been neutered. And the reason the Fed has been neutered is because we're printing $2 trillion a year in extra issuance. The Treasury needs to borrow that much just to keep the government afloat. And so that liquidity is going into the economy. And unfortunately, the Fed has a very blunt instrument. They could raise rates to try to choke off aggregate demand. But if they do that, who are they hurting? Well, to be fair, they're hurting the government. Because it decreases their ability to tax, it will create even a bigger deficit and creates a, a kind of bad you know, circle going the wrong direction. 
On the other hand, if they can kind of engineer inflation in assets without triggering as much consumer inflation, now they're doing what they need to do. That's kind of what they want to do. So all this posturing about 2% inflation targets, that's a load of happy horse. That, you, that's crazy. They're you, never getting there. You brought up something really crucial. You said, in your view, the Fed will cut if the stock markets crash. Okay, the stock markets already, they're factoring in, they're baking in a cut. That's priced in. Several cuts, for that matter. So the stock markets will be disappointed that this doesn't happen. They crash, then the Fed cuts. So basically what you're saying, if I can synthesize this, a sort of correction is imminent. It's inevitable because either way, it has to happen for the Fed to do something. If the stock market's a Fed, you know, they're anticipating well, the Fed. I mean, yeah, it, right. it, it's, it, it, in, in real dollars, maybe. But keep in mind something. If you're continuing to inflate, the value of the amount of dollars in circulation, our deficit goes from 34 to 36 trillion. And the stock market stays the same price. Did it go down or did it stay the same price? Well, it actually went down in real terms because now there's more dollars out there as your denominator. And so it, it really matters. There just isn't a lot of places to put people's money. You, if you're a, a pension fund, this is a point, um, Mike McGlone from Bloomberg and I have this argument all the time. The fact is the actuarial assumptions, what happens to all the people who are managing sovereign wealth, pension funds, endowments, et cetera, is generally somewhere on the low end at 6% and on the high end between 8 and 9% assumptions of, of returns. Putting your money into overnight rates, which are at 5.3, you know, overnight to three months, uh, is effectively locking in a loss. So people don't tend to do that for long. They could. If you want to put it into 10-year, you're at 4.4. That's definitely locking in a loss. And if you look at how flat the curve is, it's basically flat from three years to 10 years right now. Flat with a little dip down. So there's not really a lot of rate cuts priced in between now and three years from now. It's really pretty tame. If you look at the, at the yield curve, it's very interesting. The fact is none of those numbers are enough to convince pension funds to pull their money out of a stock market that continues to inflate with inflation uh, in order to go into bonds. Because you get paid back in, in future dollars, not in today's dollars. And so that discounted cash flow idea, when you bake in inflation to the cake, is what's supporting the stock market. Now, yes, there's also a lot of story, narrative, AI hype, all sorts of things. And, and stocks are notoriously less volatile or more volatile than bonds. But keep in mind, you don't have to have a crash. It, it's, it's, in my opinion, likely that when volatility gets really low, eventually you'll get a liquidation cascade of some sort uh -huh. because it always happens. But we're already in very, very, I mean, statistically anomalous grounds in terms of number of months without a 10% correction. It, uh, is, it is pretty significant. Yeah, I've there's two sides of this argument. One, this is just a new sustained bull rally. Or two, the longer you stretch this elastic band, the tighter it's going to be wound and the harder it will fall when it does eventually break. All right? Could be. Keep in mind, we have an election year and we have divergent possibilities in this election. Sure. And, and those divergent possibilities are going to keep people from making huge bets until it becomes clear. Right. If we continue to have another four years of heavy regulatory burdens and a very uh, um, MMT biased uh, economic policy, that is one very different path than a path of deregulation uh, that is, is theoretically being promised. Whether it's going to happen or not, I don't know. And then but there's also there's other cross currents. We have geopolitical issues that cause people to be, you know, worry about what's going on. It, all of this together makes for what you would think to be underpriced volatility in the market, which is, I think, your point, David, and I kind of understand it. It's just a question of where does the money go elsewhere, absent that spark, because that spark could happen. It feels to me very similar to past election years where we did see significant volatility in the back half of the year. I wouldn't be surprised to see it, but I don't think it's necessarily certain. Tell us about the mindset of institutional investors, because you've, you've worked on the institutional side. You've got Bitcoin. Let's talk about Bitcoin specifically. You've got Bitcoin at new all-time highs as we speak right now. Those funds that perhaps haven't gotten in on the Bitcoin ETF or products that they could buy now, would they wait for a pullback or would they get in now? Depends on the type of fund. 
So here's what's actually happening. So there's, if you think about it, on the on the edge, there's the hedge fund types, the people who are the asset allocating for return, you know, in a, a whatever. I think those people have either been at, are either allocated to it or are waiting for a pullback. But you got the rest of the funds. Most of the wealth of of the, in the world is held by various and sundry wealth funds of which many still haven't even gotten through their due diligence to say that they're allowed to evaluate the asset. And those are the funds that are the most interesting. So longer term type asset allocators, that's where the demand comes through. Because let, let's understand what is the supply demand dynamic. If you believe that Bitcoin has a 50% chance of becoming digital gold, that means you think just this is simple math. If that you think Bitcoin will go to basically 10x this, because to be equivalent to gold's market cap today, it's between six and $700,000 per Bitcoin. So if you see a 50% chance of a 10x, right. that's the kind of thing that whether it's a 71 or 65, doesn't matter. You're basically just going to make your allocation slowly and put your chips there to where, to where you think they're going to be and create it. And, and, and that's the reality. So that's why I often say that the squiggles don't matter to the long-term big money, but that takes longer to come across the finish line. They're all in the due diligence process. I, I'm just wondering who's getting in now, the retail people or the uh, or the institutional. I mean, the, the, the retail investors, we can make a case. Now is the time for hype. They're getting in. They're getting more attention. This happened last time. I'm just putting myself in the perspective of, let's say, um, the shoes of an analyst working at a hedge fund. Uh, who that hasn't bought Bitcoin yet, and I'm pitching to my PM, let's buy some Bitcoin now. There's hype. The first question is, why are we buying at an all-time high? And I don't know how to answer that question. Right? How would you answer well, that the, question? The answer is simple. First of all, there's way less retail participation by every metric. So we'll give you a few. I was heard this morning. The the on-chain metric that a lot of people who want to measure hype is called realized, uh, you know, realized profit basically compared to the current price. And right now it's around between two and two and a half. In previous hype cycles, it's gone as high as 10. And so there's not a lot of hype, you know, based on the on-chain buying. Um, as far as off-chain goes, social media mentions, news stories, you know, everything, it, it is really, really low. In terms of Coinbase's own data, in terms of retail buying, it's not off the hizzle, as it were. I mean, retail is just not the major thing. Most of the new money is coming from traditional finance through brokerage into the ETF products. And most of the ETF issuers are saying they're coming from smaller institutions, high net worth individuals, not retail day traders. Generally, at every other all-time high we've had since Bitcoin started, it was day traders. that, And typically on leverage, that was pushing it up. But the leverage in this cycle has been markedly less than in previous hype cycles. Okay, perfect. Uh, so bottom line, previous all-time highs have been met with a sharp correction. Do you think this time is going to be different? I hate those words. I think that it, it hasn't been different. It, it, it has been different, not going to be different. You know, we're already at, at we're, we're north of three plus weeks of this trading range. Uh, I think we can easily see it go for a lot longer than people realize, or the supply could just literally run out. Uh, most pundits, I know most people in the Bitcoin space, they're not anticipating a rally until the third or fourth quarter. They just aren't. They're saying the summer is generally boring. You know, we'll kind of meander around here, whatever happens. That does not feel the same as it did the last three times that Bitcoin got to all-time highs. You know, if you look at, at the, the most the most analogous in terms of the chart pattern, uh, that was the year, that was basically 2017. Now, it's not, it wasn't an election year, so it's not the same. But in 2017, yeah, there were some rallies. There were some sharp falls. It was extremely volatile. Then it kind of settled into the fall, and then in the toward the winter it exploded. Uh, you know, a four, you know, basically four x, five x. Do I expect that to happen? No, but the charts, the 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 action feels the most similar to that. Now, is that likely? Uh, you know, I don't know. I don't think so. I kind of look at this as this is different because the nature of the buyers are different. David, that's the only thing that's different. It doesn't change greed and fear. If it starts taking off and going in past a hundred thousand, people will get FOMO and they'll over leverage. And then when they get over leverage, it's going to get slammed back down, etc. Uh, what? One more question before I let you go, Dave. Uh, according to I'm reading this article from Coin Telegraph. According to data from Crypto Quant CEO Ki Jong Un, uh, Ju, the uh, current cost of mining. Uh, will rise from forty thousand to eighty thousand after the Bitcoin halving in mid-April. 
uh, a doubling of the mining cost post having. So if we assume these numbers are correct, one of two things could happen. Either you, either the Bitcoin price will likely just sustain above $80,000 naturally, or perhaps we should short the Bitcoin miners because they're going to lose money. What's more it likely? It depends on the miner. As my friend Mike Alfred would say, not all miners are created equal. Sure. Right. So when you get an average of 80,000, there's a lot of machines that are running right now that are going to get pulled offline as soon as the halving happens. Right. Older machines, machines that are paying more in terms of electricity. So the real question is, what is necessary to sustain? And remember, a lot of Bitcoin capacity now is in renewables. And as you get into the summer, electricity demand uh, tends to be higher. And a lot of the renewables will then come offline uh, as part of the whole buffering of Bitcoin, you know, so that Bitcoin is there to incentivize grids. There's a lot of things going on. The fact is, is mining as a whole you have to make the argument that why has it been beaten down as much as it has been? It's because of that number that you just said. So this question is, which miners have the capacity to be profitable even in a post-having world where Bitcoin might be at 60,000 or at 70,000 and not 80? And so you really have to do some analysis. It is not obvious at all. And certainly in the macro, it isn't. Because I would expect post-having a fairly serious amount of hatch rate to come offline and then to build back up again as more efficient miners are deployed and more cheap sources of power uh, come online. So it really is not as monolithic as that. That's always been the one of the main things that people new to Bitcoin always say is they always say, oh, well, if it falls below the cost of mining, there's going to be this debt spiral and Bitcoin's going to die. I mean, I lost track of how many obituaries have been put on Bitcoin. But it, seriously, you laugh, but it's true. I mean, The Economist, the FT, I mean, people say these things. And it's off of that stupid assumption, which says that we're living in a two-dimensional economy. The, the, there are actually many, many variables that go into every miner's mix. And that is how it will play out. It will play out differently for each one. Perfect. Uh, good stuff. Tell us more about coin routes and where we can learn about coin routes, your work, and what we can uh, what we can learn from coin routes. We're doing we're we're in the middle of several exciting things at coin routes. So we we have our volumes are going through the roof from our clients because we're providing a suite of tools like spread trading where they can trade between multiple assets and instruments. You know we've introduced over the last year mobile. We've introduced a lot of other things. We're actually now accepting on coinroutes.com. Uh, slash pro uh, for a waiting list for the end of the year, we're planning on debuting a high net worth active trader product for individuals. Right now, we provide a white glove service for institutional crypto traders, uh, but we're going to go to a more self-service model where a lot of these tools will be available to active traders. That's probably the most important thing that we're doing technologically. We're also, since you have a global audience, opening our office in Dubai. And in fact, our CEO is now officially a Dubai resident. And They'll all be, most of our team will be at Token 49 or 2049. Uh, I guess it's next week or the week after. I think it's, it starts next week. And so, it, you know, externalizing off the shores of the United States is a big deal for us. You know, it's kind of unfortunate in a way that the U.S. is pushing companies like ours overseas, but that is the world we live in. And so it is a phenomenon that is here to stay. And the rest of the world wants to be able to invest and wants to be able to trade with professional tools. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dave. We'll speak again soon. Thank you, David. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe and follow CoinRoutes in the links down below.